One of the greatest struggles that we had in politics was being yourself. And one great experience that we've had in Kluas Kejab is that we can be ourselves. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and salam sejahtera. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Edin, for that very, very generous and kind, perhaps undeserved introduction. Pauline, thank you very much for having Sharil and I here at the Georgetown Literary Festival. We don't quite know what to expect because we were told to talk about books and the written word. Not many people know this, but Sharel and I, before the recording of every episode, we actually swat up quite a bit on what we're about to talk. We don't wing it. So last night, I'm a very last minute person like Edin, skijap skijap, deadline skijap. So last night, I, in, in my desperate attempt to sound literarily intellectual this morning, I decided to reread War and Peace at 10.30 last night. <laughs> I didn't manage to finish it. But um, Sharel and I will do our best to talk about ideas this morning. I'm going to kickstart the session by telling you how I met this guy next to me. And this is not planned. <laughs> and and I, didn't, I didn't tell him this. I, I, this morning, I, when we met at the airport, I said, can you talk about your three favorite books? That was a ruse. So this is the real thing. Um, a lot of people ask, how did we meet? There's an age difference here of about a decade, about 10 years. Um, he's younger, I'm older. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, they always wonder because, you know, we have this chemistry on the podcast. I met Sharil through his writing. And this speaks to who we are as people. And I don't want to speak on his behalf. He can do that later. But I met him when he was still a student at university. He was studying economics and politics in the UK. But I came across Sharel Hamdan through an article that he wrote about me. And it was an incisive article, an article that wasn't comfortable to read for me because it wasn't kind, but it was honest. And I knew that I had to meet this person because the audacity of somebody <laughs> that age without any experience, to deign that he would write something about me, felt worthy of my attention and my time. And we got talking, and my initial suspicions were confirmed that this was a young man who was driven, of course, by principles and values, and I think that that's important in politics, but equally important is that this is a person who is driven by ideas. And I think that's the main crux of what we want to talk about this morning. How ideas must drive political change. How it's not expediency. It's not the instrumental benefit of being involved in politics, but rather it's the intrinsic notion that you're doing something because of ideas that you believe in. And that's how we got to know each other. Sharel ended up working with me when he came out of university. Then he decided to spread his wings further, 
went off to do a postgraduate degree, became a management consultant. We both ended up in politics and we both find ourselves now in political exile together. And during this phase of exile, we thought to ourselves, and I remember this conversation earlier this year in January when we were sacked. I was sacked and he was suspended from, from the party that doesn't do well in Penang. Um, <laughs> but he said to me, why don't we use this time to showcase ideas? Not in the sense that we have a monopoly on ideas, but in a sense that we should find a way how ideas can matter in politics once again. Because one thing that I completely regret about my political career, and I hope one day if I ever decide to go back into politics, I don't repeat this, is the fact that you become extraordinarily stupid in politics. <laughs> and I say that because you stop reading and you stop writing. The two most important things to proliferate ideas, which is to write and which is to read, you stop doing. Because you don't have the time, you don't have the bandwidth, and you certainly don't have the colleagues who engage you in that way. So I'm gonna stop there and ask you what you think about my introduction. Um, thanks everyone, thanks um, for, for having us here. I was going to thank Edin for that kind introduction. I should do the same for you. Um, I think that is one part of our history and our present that not everybody knows. Um, and that dynamic that he so eloquently described at the genesis of our friendship or our, our getting to know one another is probably what makes this podcast work as well. That we are extremely focused on what kind of ideas we can put forth in the episodes that we record, but also to, I think, expose the contingency and the limitation that we have as individuals about how comfortable we are with these ideas and how communicating these ideas is a completely different task than simply understanding them on text. And one of the things that we wanted to do when we, we did this podcast was to translate, to bridge the gap uh, between what we thought was, you know, maybe highbrow or something that's a bit more comfortable with this kind of audience and bridge the gap to the lay person who is no less intelligent, no less passionate about things that matter but maybe doesn't have the same lexicon or doesn't have the same you know, uh, vo vocabulary or, or vernacular uh, that we may be comfortable with. So I think that bridging of generations, that bridging of ideas to, to, uh, to some communication that people can receive is the journey of our kind of friendship and the journey of this country. And when we find ourselves now in exile, uh, we've stumbled upon perhaps a medium that uh, we didn't expect to be this big. Uh, we're extremely privileged and grateful to have it. We started it off almost as a laugh, but now it stands on its own terms and its own merits. Uh, people at the start were quite cynical. Was this one way to keep relevant? Was this one way that we will go back to, the pub to public life, to politics? I think again, Klaus Kajab now, with the support from people like you and the rest of the country, stands on its own terms and it should be judged on its own terms. One of the most memorable quotes from this year in our podcast came from the great literary figure, Sanusi Matno, the chief minister of Kedah, when he appeared on a special episode of Klaus Kajab where we asked him, what was the single most important advice you received as a relative newcomer? And he came from nowhere and suddenly became the Menteri Besar of Kedah and this larger than life figure as we know today. And he told us, and I suspect he was quoting the great lyricist Chris Cornell from the band Soundgarden. 
He said, Tok Guru bagi tahu saya, just be yourself. <laughs> and he said it precisely like that, just be yourself. And we, I found it profound, and I think Sharil found it profound as well, because one of the greatest struggles that we had in politics was being yourself. And one great experience that we've had in Kluas Kejab is that we can be ourselves. And it's not, it's not that you fake it when you're in politics, but when you're in politics, politics itself, especially party politics, necessitates that you conform to some extent. And you have to tame your instincts. You have to make sure that you are part of a team and sometimes that has a toll on you and a toll on your sense of belonging. And look, please don't take this by meaning that I disagree with the discipline of party politics. I do believe that party politics, political parties need to have discipline. Otherwise, it will look extremely, extremely unruly. But at the same time, it takes a toll on people who believe in things, who have ideas. And sometimes those ideas may be at odds. If you're lucky enough to be belong to a political party, which is a big tent and has a benevolent leader that accepts those multitude of voices within the big tent, that's fine. But if you have somebody who is less tolerant of diversity of views, less tolerant of mavericks who may want to chart a path of their own, that brings with it a lot of challenges. And that brings me to the setup that I told Cheryl this morning, which is, tell us about your worldview, Cheryl. And, and, and I have introduced it that way because I know what you're about to say. But tell us about your worldview and some of the key ideas and books that have informed this worldview of yours. Yeah. Um, first, I just wanted to make a reference to the actual uh, title of our session. Let's talk about text. Uh, somebody texted me and said, I wonder how many people understood that reference um, and, and what song it came from. Um, but to your actual setup, which is to try and use this session to kind of speak about our, our worldview and, and the texts that have influenced that worldview. I shared on the phone last night, last evening, when, when we spoke briefly, that upon reflection of my adult life, most of my life, especially in this moment of exile and of transition, which also fits with uh, terra incognita, yes. uncharted territory. So we are in we our are. Uncharted, uncharted territory right now. Sorry. My, my, my story is, um, I, I make no claims to trauma or, or you know, dislocation. But like many people, I think my story is one where I try and find a home and I try and find a belonging. I am a child of mixed parentage, so my mother's Chinese, my, my father's Malay. That in itself is no, you know, a lot of people go through that. Um, I grew up, however, in a very working class uh, background, in flats in Shah Alam, in the 90s. And from that age, I, from a very young age, it was about fitting in. Because my mother, to her eternal credit, Dia masuk Islam, dia tak semestinya masuk Melayu. So she retained, retained slash retains a very Chinese culture, identity, whatever that means, right? But um, as a eight, nine year old though, that was sometimes difficult for me in a country and in a setting where you have to be one or the other. Lah. So I went through periods in my life, KJ and everyone, where I tried to assert my Malayness, almost ditch my Chinese-ness. Um, and I look back, my time in Amno. I don't know, that's a repeat of that, right? I'm always having to prove a certain authenticity to the idea of what Malayness is. Now, that's one dimension of my struggle of having to fit in. Um, 
so there's always that imposter syndrome that's always hanging on my head, right? Who am I? Or how do I fit in this? Even in politics, so move the ethnicity aside, the practice of politics, the art of politics, you know, KJ is one of the best proponents of it, of being somebody who's, you know, has a mass appeal. I am probably more on the introverted side of things. So trying to fit in into a political culture, a party political culture where you have to have gusto, luster, you have to speak, you know, at a certain volume, you're supposed to inspire people, that comes less naturally to me than maybe it does to him. So that again, another dimension of the imposter syndrome that I've always had to, you know, almost bridge or, or, or get to. Um, so this, this sense of ambivalence, this sense of hybridity, this sense of where do I belong against absolutes, right? Uh, 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 and uh, a sense that I don't agree with absolutisms because I don't fit into any, yet one thing to fit into one, the contradiction and the limitations of the human you know, mind in my case. Um, I think that's my, my own self-reflection about my own journey um, in, all, in many areas of life. So, I wanted to begin, KJ, with um, actually a book that I, I read when I was kind of 11, 12, maybe. It's called The Little Prince, uh, which I think many of you will know. Um, my daughter now in her room, I have uh, a poster, poster. Uh. of one of the quotes, uh, all that is essential is invisible to the eye. Uh, so it's, a, it's written by, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. So um, it's, a, it's a book that I, I learned a lot from when I was 11, 12. I love the fact that there were many allegories, metaphors, lessons about human contradictions. So it began to like appeal to me in my own internal you know, disjuncture. Uh, so The Little Prince was one book. I mentioned just now about hybridity, ambivalence. That's really a, a theme in my life. And I wanted to mention three clusters, uh, three books in, in, in this cluster of identity and identity defined ambivalently. Uh, one is called The Location of Culture by Homi Baba, uh, which I read when I was in university. Uh, so it's, it's an Indian author. Um, he, he writes about the idea of hybridity. This was in, context of, in the context of post-colonial identity, KJ. So there was a sense that, you know, as subjects of the colony, you mimic uh, and you hybridize yourself. And I think that's also relating to people like us, where people sometimes mock us. We mock ourselves for being a bit Anglophile, you know, looking up to, to, the, to, to the UK, when also at the same time realizing that we're not, you know, colonial subjects or not do we like the fact that uh, we were uh, colonized by them at some point, but having that, that sense of, you know, ambivalence about what's our relationship to that country and that former colonial power. So the location of culture is one thing that really uh, affected me when I was, uh, was university. Another one is by Benedict Anderson, Imagine Communities, which I think many people would have read. Um, Ben Anderson spent a lot of his life in Indonesia yep. um, and that began to highlight to me in a very intellectual way the constructedness of race and ethnicity. Mm. Um, again, by the way, another point of contradiction, paradox, I say that I fully realize how constructed race and ethnicity is, yet I entered UMNO which is a fully race-based party, right? So that I'm still going through that, you know, understanding that. Uh, I'll explain that on, in another day. It's okay, Mahade is quite fluid as well. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to end that cluster with a Malaysian book or a book by Malaysian intellectual Farish No, The Other Malaysia, uh, which I think is a collection, well, it, it was a collection of um, articles that he's written over when he was a bit younger, which spoke to that, you know, um, identity being fluid, identity being hybrid, Malaysian identity necessarily being hybrid versus what we know, KJ, is the mainstream uh, articulation of Malaysian identity, even in a multicultural setting, is always supposed to be absolutes, right? Absolute Malay, absolute Chinese, absolute ident um, Indians, for example, and other ethnicities, and we list them down, when in reality, each of these categories are themselves hybridized and fluid. Um, lastly, um, on my economic outlook, and this will sound controversial to some, though it shouldn't. Uh, I've always been a bit more left-leaning, especially when I was younger, so 
nothing nothing out of the uh, ordinary but I like many young people I read Marx growing up and while I have clearly moderated my views to be less left and I don't make claims to be a super radical person e even economically but I still retain a very high cynicism and skepticism towards neoliberal economics. So I would say any number of the Marx books would be influential. So those are the three things, KJ, around my sense of what humanity yeah. is through The Little Prince, my sense of identity, dislocation, disjuncture, hybridity with the three books I mentioned, uh, the location of culture, Ben Anderson's Imagined Communities, and, and Farish Noor's uh, Other Malaysia, and lastly, maybe say Capital from Karl Marx. So that's an example of how ideas informs worldview. And I think the greatest tragedy is when you have very instrumental politicians who are there for career purpose rather than for purposes of ideology and ideas. And your ideology may be completely out of whack with somebody else's, but at least you're a politician of conviction that's based on ideas. And I think that's the key takeaway from, from this session. I'm going to spend a bit of time to do the exact same thing that Charil did, and then probably we'll have time for uh, a bit of uh, questions and answers. So Charil started off with his, his background, and I want to do the same. I, uh, I was a child of privilege. I can't put it any other way. My father was a foreign service officer. And as a result, I was born not in this country. I was born in Kuwait. And I spent all my life, all my pre-adult life abroad. And I was accorded the best international education. And I was fortunate enough to go to university in the UK and my postgraduate degree in the UK. And I grew up with this very idealized view of the world, as you would of a, a child of a, of a diplomat studying in international schools, thinking that that was the default world out there where people got along, where you celebrate diversity. The first two, so I'm going to do three sets of two books. The first set of two books that shattered that world for me and has resulted in a, a worldview that has a hard edge, especially around Malaysia and our place in the world, was when I read as a, as a student at school, both Conrad's Heart of Darkness and then immediately after that, Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart. And that stuck with me right up until today. My competitiveness streak when I'm in government, whether it's against Singapore or against the UK or against the Matsale, I remember internally at the Ministry of Health, I'm like, we have to make sure that we vaccinate people faster than the UK. We have to make sure that we prove these farmers. You know why? Because you now this is a, this, I, I don't like speaking in abstract because I remember when I was negotiating on your behalf for all these vaccines with the top pharmaceutical company, the, probably the, the most widely used vaccine in COVID-19, I remember when I was offended. I remember that moment of colonialist thinking that got me so riled up and angry, which was, and I was arguing with them, I said, you know, we, we've put in our order, we've put on the down payment already on behalf of Malaysia, why can't you deliver it faster than you've been delivering it to the Western countries? And after a while, the answer came, which was, even if we sent it to you, the entirety of your orders now, you don't have the capacity to vaccinate quickly. I swear. I, I never mentioned this. This is part of a memoir that I'm writing. And I said, what? You, you actually... Uh, doubting our capacity to roll out the vaccines. And that's why you think that your delivery schedule should be based on what you think a sort of developing country is capable of doing. And, and that resonated with this hard edge that I had. You know, I read Conrad's Heart of Darkness. It was a, de 
a, a book that is full of depravity. I mean, if you've read it, it's about Congo. It's about this guy called Marlow who goes upriver to find Colonel Kurtz. But it's written in a, in a very Orientalist manner. Conrad wrote it, The Dark Continent, Heart of Darkness is, is not even, a, is not even a, a subtle metaphor as to how he's painting Africa at that point in time. And Chinua Achebe had a problem with this, and that's part of the reason why he wrote Things Fall Apart, which was also about imposition of colonial values and the disruption of external forces. But the way he wrote Okonkwo and his tribe and everything was more celebratory. It wasn't dark. It was a celebration of the continent. It was colorful. It was joyous. And until today, and, and, and you know, I, I, I disagree with Mahade in so many things. And that was evident perhaps in parts of our interview with him. But the one thing that I will always, and Sharil made this explicit during the interview, that I will always respect him for is that he made Malaysia punch above our weight all the time. And I, th I think that is something that we should always be proud of. That we should not bow down to anyone. And that any imposition or subjugation is unjust and unfair. And that has stuck with me. It was a point of competitiveness when I went to the UK. I went to a particular university and I felt, you know, it was important that I did well because I want to make sure that we are not underestimated. Another anecdote that I have from university, and I, this was in 1994 for God's sake, I couldn't believe that I heard this. I played football, soccer, and I played for college. I went to university where there were uh, constituent colleges, so I played first 11 at my college. And after the first game, we, um, as tradition dictates for football teams, we go to the pub to celebrate or commiserate. Don't ask me what I drank. Um, and I remember the captain of the team just with great insouciance, completely casually turns to me and said, you played well, Kyrie. You're the first colored player to play for college. This is in 1994. And he didn't mean, there was no malevolence to it. But I was just like, I, I mean, I, I couldn't, I came from a privileged background, international schools, celebrating United Nations Day, and I was exposed to the first taste of colonial subjugation when I was put in my place because of the color of my skin. So the first two sets of book that still drives me, the competitive streak that Malaysia has to be the best, is, is my experience with those two books, which left a, a, a huge uh, in, imprint uh, on me. Um, the second, perhaps, set, uh, rather, the, the, the second book that, um, or second two sets of books that I wanted to talk about is the Malay condition. As a Malay politician, I'm obsessed by the Malays because, not because, other communities don't matter, obviously, that's not how I feel, but because it's a majority community, whatever happens to the Malays defines this country. You can't run away from it. And the two sets of books are two different worldviews of how you see the Malay condition. And one book is a wonderful book. It's almost autobiographical that was written by Shannon Ahmad, um, who was a national laureate and he became a member of parliament. And um, he, he was prolific. He wrote this book about a fictional kampong in Kedah of paddy farmers called Ranjau Sepanjang Jalan. Some of you may have read it. Some of you may have seen a, a film um, adaption of Ranjau Sepanjang Jalan. And it tells the story of this paddy farmer called Lahuma and his family and he ends up stepping on a, on a thorn and he gets infected, he passes away. The wife has to take over, they're paddy farmers. Kais pagi makan pagi, kais petang makan petang. And there is a strong sense of fatalism in, in this book. 
and it speaks to the Malay worldview of kada dan kada fatalism. Accept your your lot in life. This is what it's all about. You deal with the the ranjau or the thorns along the way, and that's just it. And that's the way it has to be. And I read that, and maybe a year later, I read perhaps the most important self-help book in Malay literature, which is The Malay Dilemma by Dr. Mahathir Muhammad, <laughs> which basically tells you, don't be a useless, lazy Malay. Get out there and change your lot in life. So those two books always juxtaposes the Malay condition for me. The Malay condition of fatalistic acceptance of the daily rigmarole of whatever fate has given us, the straw that we've drawn, and the iconoclast that comes along and says, come on, get with it. This has nothing to do with the conditions that you were born in. You have agency. Forget about the fact that you're poor. Forget about the fact that there are multiple obstacles along your way. Bootstrap yourself and get out of this. And I'm not saying that he's right. I'm saying that there are serious structural predicaments and obstacles against people succeeding in life and having material success. And that's where the state comes in. But I'm just saying that those two books are like the contrast of how I look at the Malay condition today and how I've treated my career as somebody who identifies himself as a Malay nationalist. Yes, Sharila and I are relatively progressive, liberal. I don't know if he does identify himself as such, but I do identify myself in the vein of a 1970s Ton Razak Malay nationalist. And that comes both from my appreciation of the fatalism in Shannon's works, as well as in uh, the self-help creed, the almost Protestant work ethic that Mahade introduced um, in his writing and later in his premiership, especially his first premiership. The last two books speaks to my political philosophy. And it speaks to a complex, not contradictory, but complex synthesis of how I look at individual rights as well as group solidarity. And the first is the treaties, the two treaties on government by John Locke, who is the father of classical liberalism. And this was a book that I read at university. It was compulsory reading for us. Uh, but juxtaposed with that is the introduction to history by Ibn Khaldun. So just very, very basically and um, as quickly as I can, Locke introduces the principle of consent. You consent. As people, you consent to a government. But once the government violates the social contract of looking after your rights, you have the right to rebel. That's classic liberalism in a sentence or in two sentences. And it's not something that's Western, by the way. If you read Sejarah Melayu, the Malay annals, the social contract lies at the heart of even a monarchical system that we're used to today. In this mythical encounter between Sang Sapurba and Demang Leba Daun, which is the start of Malay history as we know it, is the social contract saying that you will be obedient to your leader um, for as long as that leader is just to you. Once the leader is not just to you, then you have, the re you have reason and just cause to rebel. Uh, Raja Adil di Sembah, Raja Zalim di Sanggah. I mean, it's even got its own pribahasa. And that is our social contract, at least in, the, in this part of, of the, in the Malay polity. And that puts front and center the concept of individual rights. To think that as Asians, we value the community above the individual is not true. Because within that contract, which comes from Locke, which has, its, which has its legacy also in Malay literature, shows that individual rights, whether it's property, whether it's thought, whether it's conscience, is important. 
But alongside that, which is very much focused on the individual, comes also the community. And I'm always, always attracted by how Ibn Khaldun saw the world. Earlier philosophers, classical philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, they would always look at the ideal life, what the good life is. And they would write about what that good life is. Whether it's in the Nicomachean ethics, whether it's in the Republic, it's always the idealized state. But modern philosophers, Ibn Khaldun onwards, studied what was. And he was a great sociologist. He was probably the first sociologist in the world. And he studied the, the rise and fall of civilizations, Bedouin tribes, cities, in where he was. And he came to the conclusion that without group solidarity, what he called asabiyah, it has a negative connotation in Malay politics, asabiyah, once those things fray, then civilization collapses. So my pol political philosophy is finally balanced between the two. I do not like political systems which encroach to the extent that that social contract which respects individual rights are violated, but I at the same time also don't believe in an atomized society. The state of nature imagined by classical liberals like Locke and Hobbes, where you are just individuals and you're not social animals and you lead, you, you lead a very short, nasty and brutish life in competition with one another. I believe in group solidarity. There's something to be said about that. Of course, there, are, there is a dark side to group solidarity and this is something we can speak about later, which is political tribalism. Tribalism is hurting us today. It's making us extremely polarized. It's making the center ground disappear. But tribalism or group solidarity in a positive sense is social trust. It's what defines us as a people. It's what enables us to become social animals, not atomized individuals, but rather people who work within a society and work towards a uh, greater purpose, maslaha umum in, in Malay. So that really is the idea behind why I'm in politics. And again, once again, I just wanted to say that when in politics, it's difficult for Sharil and I to explain this because this is not something you can distill into a charama. You don't go on an election campaign and talk about Ibn Khaldun and Locke, Little Prince, and Benedict Anderson's Imagine Community. But that has to be the thing that drives politics. And um, I think we've just been shown the 10 minute uh, sign. This is a good time for us to open for q and Is that okay with you, Cyril? Yep. Or do you, you wanna say anything? No. Yep. So we've got about 10 minutes. Uh, we're happy to hear you guys, um, you know, say that that was complete rubbish or whatever. <laughs> Please, yes. Um, I think there are mics, yeah. Thanks. I have uh, two questions, if I may. Uh, number one, for either one of you, uh, how does a podcast, uh, not necessarily your podcast, but podcast in general, help promote uh, the reading culture in Malaysia? Sure, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do that very quickly. Um, I don't know if it helps reading culture, but I think it helps. Um, it helps what we're trying, what we've been trying to say this whole this whole time we've been on stage, which is how important ideas are and making us believe what we believe in and why we do what we do. I think sharing that through different mediums have been a journey, right? You, we we started off writing. Kai, you said you know our, our relationship, getting to know one another, was even through writing, through my writing of of something many many years ago. We then went through in our political career the proliferation of short form content uh, and the sense that, and I think a lazy assumption if I may say now, that younger people or people in general were so hooked on their phones and were willing and wanting to always uh, swipe and always wanted to only see things for 30 seconds or two minutes and we had a period, we're still in that period, I'm not saying we're out of it, where 
the, 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 the main form of communication for political parties, for brands, for anything, is really to get the virality uh, quotient right. So that exists and that will probably dominate for quite a period of time. But what, the, what, what it does not have and what it can never have is the ability to communicate fully thought through cooked ideas in all its, in all its imperfections, in all of its nuances, in all of its uh, uh, two-sidedness, however you want to explain it. So I think podcast is how the long form content is fighting back and trying to tell people and telling society that there is a, there is a way that long form content can exist in a world where you're always on the move, in a world where you are less likely to sit down and read, in a world where uh, you are multitasking at all times. So we hear people listening to our podcast when they are stuck in traffic. We hear it when, uh, we hear that they listen to it when they go for a run, when they're at the gym, when they're cooking. So these are all things that cannot be done with reading, right? Reading, you can only do that and nothing else. So I think that's where the podcast form, not just ours, but the rest, uh, is, is again, bridging the gap or existing in this interstices of old form and new form? I, I, I think that's a great question. And when we, Sharad and I, now divide our time, and time for everyone is limited, and we have to put it where we think the resources are needed. I mean, I at least now spend more time thinking and preparing for the podcast than I do writing, which I want to correct. But I think there's a reason for that and try to hear me out. I've accepted the fact that Malaysia is not really a country or a civilization that is big on written history. And we know this for a fact, and historians know this. The fact that early Malay history was reliant on Orientalist texts, Suma Orientalists, Tome Piraeus, the fact that you know one of the only markers that we have is Sulatus Salatin, Malay Annals, Sejarah Hang Tuah, but you know the written history. There's this big chain that's broken. I didn't you know this? Uh, and I don't think uh, one is of course you can try to increase the output of written history, but why swim against the tide? You should do that, but why not swim with the tide? which is to make sure that you create better output in terms of oral history. And I think that that's what we're doing with the podcast. I mean, at first, podcast and the term itself sounds frivolous, but after doing 60 episodes, I turned to Sharon and I said, you know, in our small way, we're contributing towards oral history. And if there's nothing that we can do about the culture of reading in Malaysia, at least we are still involved in the propagation of ideas because that's ultimately what it's all about. Whether and the production reading, of culture. And the, and the production of and culture. And the production of culture. The, so, you know, history to me is a marker of civilization. If one day people want to know what people thought about in 20, the 2020s, amongst the many things that they could look at is archived videos of Kluas Kejap and these two guys talking about what's happening in the world or what's happening in Malaysia. So I do wish we were more of a, a, a writing and, and reading a country with a better written history, but we have to embrace our oral uh, tradition as well because we are an oral country. You study uh, the history of Malaysia, it is, a, it is oral, not just in recent history, but uh, for hundreds of years. My next question is direct to YBKJ. I've been watching the podcast, eh, your podcast with Tun Mahathi several, several times because I was trying to catch the nuances and the, the, the questions you asked. You, you, you were the one who contributed uh, to, the, the, to, the, to 1.6 1 million. million to 1.6 yes, million. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and, uh, and the more I, 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 I watch it and just now, when you're talking about Malays, eh, I suddenly feel that you are perhaps morphing into a new Tun Mahathi. Is that... Is that, is that the case? <laughs> to, uh, you, you seem to be like uh, a bit Malay centric. Is, is, is this a creation of a. Oh, I'll let him answer okay. that. Let me say it first and see how he responds. 
So I, I mentioned this uh, in in one of the episodes I think after that that interview with Tone, which is that when I was working for him uh, many years ago when I was in my twenties, the joke inside the office and he never knew this I think is that he's more of a Mahathir than he liked to admit. So he, that was then, yeah. That was then when he was fourth floor boy, when Mahathir was going after him every day, when he was fighting the sun, and all of that stuff, right? Even then, we could see uh, that in his character and the way he brings himself and his complete self-belief. Pause. <laughs> which is good and not so good sometimes. Uh, he's more Mahathirist than uh, than maybe he realizes. So that's my take as somebody who has seen it. <laughs> I remember Jocelyn Tan, who is a columnist at the Star, once wrote, and this quote has stuck with me until today. Um, she was writing a, a, an op-ed a piece when Mukris, who's Mahade's son, and I competed uh, for the leadership of Amno Youth, which it turns out is the reason why he doesn't like me. Anyway, um, so she ended the story by saying, Mukris might be Mahade's biological son, but Kairi is Mahade's political son. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not sure. But I can only answer this by saying that, apart from punching above the weight globally, one thing that I do admire about him, and I don't know if it's something that is worth replicating or whether I do it subconsciously, as Shariel mentions, is the force of conviction. Of course, that lands you, lands you into trouble because you are unmalleable uh, or not flexible. But at least you know what that person is about. And that person is not trying to be everything to everyone. But rather, you, you know, come as you are. What you see is what you get. Anyone else? Hi, um, I guess this is also sort of a two-part question. You mentioned books by authors who are all men. Are there any books by women authors that influence you either in your life or your political career? And secondly, I think I've watched or listened to most of the episodes. Will there be a woman panelist? <laughs> Um, I think your first one, the one that comes to mind is not a full book, but the one that really influenced me is Gayatri Spivak, Can the Subaltern Speak? It was, a, it was an essay, a long essay. Um, I think that was one that alongside the, the Baba one, alongside Anderson, alongside the identity and you know, marginalized communities fighting back. And so Spivak was definitely somebody that, that I continue to you know, to read and, and reference from time to time and when I have time. Uh, on your second question about having a woman panelist, I think KJ will echo this. We've been really, you know, trying to correct that and we are, I think we should take some responsibility for not being able to do that earlier. Uh, it's, a, it's, also a, a, it's also a reflection of the fact that we are very politics heavy in this first year. Uh, and not to say that it aren't female politicians, but you know, of a certain pedigree and uh, you know, weight, if you know, I can just use that term loosely, um, I guess the, the male ones were more easy to get to. Um, but that's something that we have to take responsibility and do better at as well, for sure. Yeah, I mean, if there's, a, if there's self criticism for the first year of KS is that we didn't manage to get more female guests on the show. That was not by omission or by design. We tried hard. Some said no. Uh, this is not an excuse, of course, but just yeah, try to some explain. Say no. Some said some no. Some said no. <laughs> um, but we have to look, we have to do better. We have to do better for sure. So we are planning a few um, great guests in the, in the new year that can better balance the representation on, on KS. And, and we're terribly sorry about that. We yeah. were, it, it, it was a source of tremendous 
uh, turmoil for us internally as well because it was like oh not again but I think outside politics KJ is easier lah. If, yeah, we, if we broaden yeah, it yeah, to be yeah, you know yeah. inspirational women women in Malaysia then a bit easier sure when sure. it's politics because we were very politics focused in the in the first year um, they, they, I'm not saying that not there are no women pol- politicians but they were a bit reluctant uh, but now that we're preparing to go beyond politics for the second year of KS I think yeah no uh, yeah I, you know, uh, female authors from A.S. Bayat to Margaret Atwood. These are people that I've read that that brought me tremendous joy. But you know, I'm I, I don't want to say I'm an Anglophile, but I learned a lot about relationships through Austin. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's not something that you know you go out there and say especially when you're a guy it's, it's, um, it's but, part of history it's part of oral history and yeah, visual but, history but, now but uh, yeah I, I, you, you, as a young man uh, reading Jane Austen is indispensable I think I can't relate to that <laughs> <laughs> even if I could I wouldn't plus I'm a great it. gossip so yeah yes this thing okay Hello and uh, greetings to KJ and Sharia. Thank you for coming to Penang. We truly appreciate it. I do have one question actually. It's on um, ideas and also diversity and also polarization. So as you mentioned previously, we d- can experience some form of polarization in the country. It is palpable already to a certain extent. And we can see that we must celebrate our diversity. But at the same time, we can also see some voices trying to use this diversity to polarize society into further polars for the extremes so my question to you guys would be from your podcast we can see that you guys invited a lot of interesting guests very diverse panels from various backgrounds so what's your take on this form of polarization and how can we use the idea of different ideas different contrasting ideas to promote diversity in the Malaysian setting that's my question thank you I think the this is my personal view. Polarization and tri- tribalism thrives in the present format of short form, what Charil mentioned just now, short form, social media, performative posts. And the algorithms reinforce your views and sequester you into this echo chamber where you think that that's precisely how everyone else thinks as well. And it hardens that, that view that you have. That's why we fight back through long form. It's hard because it's easier to read a, you know, a 140 character tweet than it is to sit through one and a half hours of a podcast. But if you don't fight back against the algorithms and the short formism of what I call political tribalism, then the polarization will become even worse. So it's not um, apple to apple conflict at all because they have it easier. It's just a one-liner. And there's no way that we can compete with one-liners because, let's face it, ideas require explanation, context. Uh, You have to carry it for longer than just a few sentences. That's how you explain things properly. And that's how we grew up learning about ideas. We certainly didn't learn it from a tweet. So it is difficult and the second thing is it's to be able to quoting one of our favorite podcasts which is the rest is politics in the UK which is to agree disagreeably disagree agreeably which is to uh, disagree agreeably and I don't see enough of that I see too much in the political discourse of wanting to score a quick put down 
wanting to uh, signal your righteous indignation at somebody else and wanting groupthink to bully that person into submission. That's, that's not good. And I feel that subconsciously, chaos is an attempt to fight against that polarization that you speak of. Maybe what I will add is two, two parts where we could help. One is to showcase guests and challenge guests um, when they make remarks that we think are a little bit too absolute, one way or another. And having a variety of these guests on a platform that we know people repeatedly watch, I think helps, so that by definition you are no, not in an echo chamber because you will have different views, right? So even in a simple way that we have different political parties represented on the podcast and get, get, uh, get the airtime, I think it's one way to help. Uh, the other way is alongside what KJ just described, it's a reflection, I think, of who we are. In this last hour, we've been talking about what drives us as individuals. So even this, co this sense of Malay politics, having to be part of a Malay polity, being part of somebody or a group that wants to reform and change Malays. Obviously, we both share that, that zeal, but you know, it, I can speak for myself because of how I explain my, my affinity with the idea of hybridity, the idea of constructedness, the idea of fluidity. So by definition, I don't like absolutes. And I think polarization thrives on absolutes, absolutisms. So having people on the podcast or having us as hosts, I, I like to think, and our, our, our thinking will definitely seep through in the way we speak and when we, when we um, talk about topics, is that we always, always try and ensure that the audience understands that even when we talk about something that's sensitive, when we talk about something that's about identity politics, it is better and more accurate to speak about it from a position of nuance, from a position of contingency, ambivalence, and hybridity. So we don't say it so explicitly, but I think it comes through in the way that we describe these things. So these two things, right? These two, uh, not polar opposites, but these two dimensions of operating in a Malaysian context where it is about ethnic politics, and you know, even in my case, embracing that as a practical reality, but articulating that in a way that I can live with, which is based on the terms that I, I described earlier. I don't mind disagreement and I don't mind polarization when it's about conviction of ideas and the contest of those ideas. That's fine. We were talking on the plane on the way here. When it comes to conviction of ideas, no matter how strongly held your views on certain uh, ideology, you, you can have a contestation with somebody else who has a polar opposite view. What we don't like is sycophancy towards individuals. That is what I think is driving a lot of the polarization today. People don't like me, for instance, because I'm not affiliated with a certain person. Yet, that person who doesn't like me probably has a similar worldview to me. But they are willing to excuse somebody else who is an anathema to them because that person supports the person that they support, for instance, hypothetically. <laughs> so uh, the world is out of whack because what you should be seeing is a confluence of ideas. I generally agree with this person because of what he thinks or what she thinks rather than I hate this person because they don't support the person that I am sycophantic towards. We have time for maybe a couple more. Yeah, one last one. One last one. Yep. Yes, yes over there. Hi, KJ and Sharil. My name is Azi. So I have three questions to you guys. Wow. Uh, <laughs> my first question is to Sharil. Uh, based on you guys, based on your reading, uh, experience, and ideas in politics. What level of uh, political literacy in Malaysians do you guys think among all Malaysians? Is it in uh, bad, good, better, or best? Uh, and why we are on that level? And to KJ, what puzzle should we complete to have a top notch uh, political literacy? And my last question is to both of you guys what is your plan to make an epic comeback in politics? Thank you. 
Hey, uh, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll do the first question first. Uh, what's what's our sense of political literacy in Malaysia? Um, not so much based on reading, just based on observation. Uh, I'll be honest. Now I can be more honest than usual, right? Uh, not great. I think our political literacy is not great. I'm not going to I'm not going to grade it A, B, C or whatever, but it's not great. Um, in part because of this polarization that we spoke about. In part because the pr proliferation of uh, short form content in a echo chamber type setting uh, in part because it is always easier with those kind of um, properties to propagate very absolutist ideas about anything. It could be about identity politics, it could be about the economy, it could be about anti-elitism, it could be about partisan. It is always going to be easier to get to that point of absolutist uh, you know, posture, black and white, evil, good, when you have this kind of 30 second, one minute, two minute uh, type content that does not allow for any room for, for, for grayness or in between spaces. So I'd say that's driven so much of why political literacy in Malaysia is not at a level that I think um, I thought it would be maybe, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. The puzzle, um, and I'm not saying that this is the last piece of the puzzle, but I just wanted to answer the question by, I didn't discuss this with Cheryl obviously, but by announcing something that we just agreed on on the plane on the way here. So one of the most frequent comments that we get in uh, our social media channels is how much people learn um, through the podcast and we learn as well uh, by preparing the podcast we are also learning it's not that, like people are learning from us we are actually learning with you so we've decided sorry sorry I'm gonna do the reveal now um, we've decided that next year we're gonna come up with a, a, a new product KS as well not Kluas Sekejap but Kuliah Sekejap <laughs> and it's going to be videos about um, principles on politics, economics, and we explain things from zero. It's 101 in Malay because everyone appreciates it when we do an explainer. So, for instance, when we're talking about the economy, I pause a little bit and I said, Charil, can you explain what KDNK is? And he'll explain what, how you calculate GDP. And he'll do the same when I talk about international affairs. Can you explain, for instance, you know, what happens at the UN or how you pass a, a parliamentary bill? Sometimes we are afraid to ask this question because we don't want to seem out of place. So we thought it's a great refresher from us. And when I was in university, the best textbooks are actually the introduction to economics. And they're actually written by Nobel Prize winners. So if you are the foremost authority on any subject, you actually are the foremost authority that have written the introduction to that particular subject. So we thought you know, that would be our contribution towards political and economic literacy next year by coming up with a new series called Kuli Askajab. It'll be us explaining uh, in simple terms what, how, how we think the world works. Um, and to end this wonderful session, thank you very much. You've been a great, great um, uh, audience here at Georgetown. Uh, about the comeback. So, is there a comeback? Yeah, we're not sure. <laughs> if you asked me in January when I was expelled from the party, I was plotting a thousand and one ways to come back, exact revenge, and win. <laughs> but I'm not sure that I, I want to do it anymore. I don't know. Um, you know, uh, I've, mental health is better. For sure. Um, more family life is better. Family life is better. More at peace with the world. Um, we can come to Penang without people giving us dirty looks. <laughs> <laughs> Penang Island. Um, so, yeah. I mean, if this is it, then I'm okay with it. You? Yeah, especially because this podcast and other things we do in life have given us a sense of how we can still have impact, alhamdulillah. Uh, without being frontline politicians, um, so that's uh, that's also that's also a reminder that there is life outside politics, and we can still scratch that itch some other way. Thank you.